Hey everybody, welcome to PC Perspective. I'm Ryan Shrout with Alan Malventano, and uh, we've got a little bit of a different setup today, both from what you're seeing and what we have in front of us. Uh, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no idea what the hell we're talking about today. I was just told <laughs> to sit down at the table and hey, we're gonna have a discussion about a product called Rapid Spar, yes. apparently. What is this that we're looking at? There's a company called Deep Spar. They're one of the companies that makes all of the uh, equipment that all of the real big like brick and mortar, hard drive, or just data recovery places use. Okay. And they decided to venture a little bit lower into like the kind of devices that they use and like trying to get um, something into the hands of more people. Okay. Right. Not not meant for just you and me. Just like oh, I I I have a hard drive that's a little bit flaky. Let me just go buy this thing because this thing costs almost two thousand dollars. Okay. It's pricey, but it's meant for like mom and pop computer repair shop. Right. Uh, it would give them some capability or just, you know, kind of like smaller computer repair shops, the capability to do some uh, manner of data recovery that's not using software tools. Right. Okay. So uh, this is not software. It is an actual piece of hardware. Um, and it's able, because it's dedicated hardware, it's able to do special things that software can't necessarily do. Okay. Um, so the, so, so we know what we're looking at here yeah. over to this so this side here Down is there. is Alan's computer where we're going to show the software side of of the tool. Yes. And then down here we have uh, actually a camera looking at the screen itself of yep. the Rapid Spar device, right? Uh -huh. So when you see us moving things and you see hands go in and out of, of the of the shot, that's what we're looking at. Yep. So this is for data recovery of drives that are going bad, that have gone bad, or just cloning operations. Can it do all of that type of stuff? Does it? It can do all those things. It can do just basic cloning. Uh, there is even a. Um, actually, I'll just look in the options here. I'm going to fire up the source drive here. Uh, there's even a thing called data acquisition. Okay. That they that they uh, offer as an add-on. It's like you have to pay to get the add-on because it's more of a forensics level thing. But it actually lets you mount the source or the target drive or both, like under the host operating system mm -hmm. over USB. Mm -hmm. um, but w anything that it does to that source drive there that we have plugged in is only ever read only. It never writes. Okay. Okay. Uh, that comes in handy. So for if it like, has to do anything to write, it would copy it to the other drive and then do that. There, there is no writing. Okay. There just is none. Okay. Like. Um, you know, nothing is really meant to be modifying things in place with this. Okay. Uh, and that's handy for like law enforcement. You're trying to do a, a case. Sure. You know, you had a hard drive from a you know, bad guy's computer and you want to be able to prove to uh, the court that you were able to like get all the data off of it, say it was a flaky hard drive. Right. right? Uh, you could prove that you got it all off and that you didn't modify, you know, the, the thing Makes you were sense. looking at, right? Uh, tamper with the evidence sure. or whatnot. Um, and also, Writing to the source drive is actually, I mean, I used to work in this field for the Navy. Mm -hmm. Writing to the source drive is like the worst thing you could do if the hard drive is on its way out. Right. Um, there are plenty of tools like maintenance, hard drive maintenance tools. There's like SpinWrite and there's like HDD Regenerator and there's other tools out there that will do. They're great for maintenance, but if you have a hard drive that's on its way out and it's making like weird clicky sounds right. and stuff like that. Yeah. And, 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 and there's very important stuff on that drive mm -hmm. that you want off you have to be careful from that point forward, mm -hmm. right? Anything that you do with the drive might be one of the last things that it does. So what are um, we looking at? What are, what are we, what are we gonna, sh what are we gonna see here? Just uh, we're gonna show the Rapid Spar at work. Yes. So there is a program called Rapid Spar Assistant, right? Now let me ask this: Do you have to use the software to use the device? You don't have to, but it is much smarter to do so. Okay. Uh, because this software enables you to do what's called targeted data recovery. So this unit doesn't have to act in a dumb manner. It can. I mean, I can go over here to imaging and I can just hit start. Right. And it'll and start it will try to copy. It'll start copying the source to the target front to back. Okay. Right? Everything it can copy. Uh, it has different ways of handling if it runs into an error. It can try to skip past them and come back to them later and things like that, right? Um, but because it's a dedicated hardware tool, it's able to do read commands that no software can do. And it's able to spin up drives. There's a couple of hard drives in this stack right here in front of me that w cannot initialize under any system I plug them into. Like they don't even show up in the BIOS. Okay. But they show up under this device because it's able to, mm. you know, it's okay. it's just dedicated hardware that's able to issue commands that a regular, you know, computer BIOS might not even understand how to do to get hmm. the hard drive to spin hmm. up. Okay. Um, 
So, so using the software is a, is a smarter way to do it, though. It's smarter because it can steer this unit into only accessing what it absolutely needs to, like the bare minimum. Right? So if, if you know there's a specific subset of files you need or yeah, something? Yeah, so th think about what you'd want to do. Perfect scenario, reading the minimum amount of data from a hard drive. How would you get to, say, like an image file on the drive? You'd have to read the master file table, mm -hmm. but only the master file table, right? And then you would parse through that and try to look for you know, whatever you were trying to find. Mm -hmm. And then when, you, when it came to recovering those files, you would want to recover only those files, right? Those are the only ones you'd want to touch. My wedding pictures were on this hard drive. It's the only thing that is unrecoverable, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You have the ability and, to target those for Yeah, and I can actually first. do that right here. So I've already, okay. I've already started the new project, which is just like you hit a button on the screen. It just, you just choose if you want to do a sector by sector image from the source to the target, mm -hmm. or you can uh, make image files. If your target drive is like a huge drive compared to the drives you're going to be working with, gotcha. You can it'll just put a file system on the target for you, and then it'll just you can it'll create it image later. files. Yeah. Um, so I can just it's it's literally this easy. Like what it's doing right now is it's scanning the master file table, and when it did that scan, you might you might have seen some things change on the screen yep. here. I mean, you can right? see there was some activity. Yeah. It only read the master file table data, and if I rescanned the master file table right now, like reload the file tree, it did it much faster, and it did it faster because it wasn't touching the source drive the second time. That's important. Anything that it reads from the source successfully, it puts on the target, and any time it goes to like reread that data later, because the more uh, work you put on the drive, the more likely you are to actually have the drive become to an unrecoverable state. Sure, right? if the, if the drive is on its way out. Right? Okay. Um, Makes sense. Now that I've read that tree, I've got, and this is a very, very old hard drive, by the way. And there's like, <laughs> like very, look at this, 2006. Okay. File. But this is the stuff that could happen. Sure, sure. Um, this could be a drive that you had sitting on your shelf. Yeah. You know, for years because you just didn't want to mess with it, and you knew something was. I bad. have lots of hard drives from laptops that I have this exact thing done. Sure. So just real quick, I can look for anything that's an image, and then I can just kind of drill down, and it kind of pre-checks everything for you. Okay. Right. And if you if you just knew that every, if you had a specific file name, and I just did a search based on that specific file name, and something came up, I could just right click on the root of this whole thing, and I can choose recover selected, which will then, in a targeted fashion, it will only instruct that device to image the files that you just did, did in your search result. Okay. Right? And I can actually do that. Recover selected, and uh, I can, uh, there's a choice here, skip, bad, skip files with bad sectors. You can do that if you just want to like ignore those, right? And maybe look at them later or try to pull them out of a full image or something like that. For now, I'll just say skip. And now, now I can see stuff happening on the there's screen. There's stuff happening on the screen, and it is recovering 412 images, but it's not pulling them over to my laptop yet. It just instructed that unit to image only those files. Over to the source drive. Over, over to the target drive. Target drive, sorry. Yeah, 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 where, yeah. where the image is at. So what was I seeing on the screen here, where the red line was going? It almost looked like a performance monitor type thing. Yeah, it shows you uh, power consumption from the source drive, uh, activity of the source drive, oh, and then I think okay. there's another line that's activity of the target drive. All right. Um, and this thing can go like really, really deep. If it runs into something that it can't read and it's trying, like, and the drive becomes unresponsive, sometimes that actually happens, like a drive just flat out times out due to some kind of a firmware bug or whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, it can actually power cycle the drive. Just on its own as part yeah. of its... Yeah. Um, if the drive is just totally unresponsive... Picking up where it, it left it, off. Exactly. Uh, and, it, and I've actually seen it do that at work. Like, that surprised me because I was like, I thought something was wrong. And then I actually had to go back and ask the guy. So it power cycles, hoping that it la allows it to continue with its work process. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. This um, is obviously a very intelligent device built by people who have a long history of data recovery. It, it is. Uh, and the another unique thing of this is that it is an internet-based, uh, there's an internet-based feature called Rapid Nebula. Okay. When you buy the device, you get a year, it's like a service. Okay. So you get a year thrown in when you buy it. And then I, it's um, a few hundred bucks per year, like extending right. the license, and what's right? What's that do? Uh, when you go into this, uh, you basically go through and you choose what kind of drive you have there, um, and what kind of interface it is. And then I already had the model number selected. This is normally the thing you would do at the beginning of the recovery. Okay. Um, and what it's doing is it's basically calling back to Rapid Nebula, which is like a server that the that the DeepSpark guys run. Mm -hmm. Um, sends some information about the drive. It actually figured out that 
uh, there are no firmware repair options available for this specific drive. Like this unit can actually do firmware repair. I see. So it's looking back for a history of other cases with this drive that may help them in terms of, we know that there's a, a specific trick with this drive mm -hmm. and how to mm -hmm. get access to data or something. If there are specific read commands that it can use on the drive that or enable it to skip past bad sectors faster, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. Um, I've Very noticed cool. an actual difference, especially with Western Digital Drives. Huh. Um, yeah, and like the, the speed of dealing with, with errors. Uh, firmware repair and optimization is like there's different levels of risk you can choose based <laughs> on the drive. Sure. Um, you know, it can do things that are only RAM related or stuff like that. There's, it, that's actually one of the most common uh, kind of failures you see. If you, you can even Google around for this. Western Digital Drives sometimes will, will fail in such a way they show up as if they're just zero capacity. Mm -hmm. like that might sound familiar to you, like just it right. shows up as zero sectors large and it looks like there's nothing there. That's actually an error uh, related with um, what's called the G-list. The G-list is the list of bad sectors, like the sectors that have been remapped out. If that list grows too big, it's stored in the same place or relative, uh, close to the same place on the firmware, which is actually stored on the platter. Uh, and if you overrun that list, it causes Just the drive to start responding really slowly, or in the case of if you get a bad checksum mm -hmm. on, on that portion of the firmware, that's the same portion that handles like, how do I deal with read and write commands? And so the drive could just, okay. I, don't, I don't know how to talk anymore, So a right? firmware fix would be to clean that up so that it you knows could, how to do the reads and writes. With this tool, you could potentially, okay. you know, clean that up. The disadvantage is you just blew away your G list, so you don't, a sector that was remapped to something else. Sure. But deal with a few, you know, missing sectors of information. As opposed versus, to having no access to the yeah, data on versus, the drive. Versus no drive, yeah. So uh, I can drill down here, you know, now that I've done my reading, my imaging of my files. Yeah. And then just to show that, you know, like, look, this will actually work, uh, there's one of the images from a very, very old sample image of a Windows install, I guess, <laughs> is what that is. Um, but you can do all that stuff with it. You can, and then, like, once you've recovered all that important data, you can just say save, and then you can pick a directory, and it just pulls it all from the destination drive right. over USB to your system. Okay. Um, or if it's, like we were talking about earlier, if it's a RAID drive, one that, it, one that this software will not be able to lock onto a file system or anything like that, you're just going to have to go in there. And once you've done your rapid nebula analysis so that the, the, Im the imager knows like, how to do everything quickly, mm -hmm. then you can go in and you can hit start. And now it's just imaging. OK. And it does not need to be remain uh, does not need connected to remain to connected to the PC at this point. So you could disconnect from your laptop and leave these two drives and the power plugged in, and it would continue its yep, its yep. process. When it does the rapid nebula thing, it actually uploads that information to the unit. The unit comes with 128 gig SSD built in. Oh, okay. So it's keeping track of anything that it learned via Rapid Spar Assistant, Rapid mm -hmm. Nebula, um, you know, any kind of project files for the drive. It actually keeps a, a like a big bitmap, like a volume bitmap of which sectors have I imaged and which ones have I not? Okay. Right. All that information is saved on that SSD internal to the Rapid Spar. So um, what's all this stuff sitting in front of me here? These are all adapters and things that come with. Obviously, that case over there is yeah, what it comes, comes in. The, comes with a nice with a metal nice case. briefcase. Yep. Obviously, if you're buying a two thousand um, uh, dollar security device, essentially, sure. right, or storage it's security device, designed to work everywhere. It comes with uh, you know, it's a universal power, power adapter. Comes with you know. 120, 240, all the different plugs. So are these just all different adapters to get different storage types to plug into this device, essentially? Yes. So um, we've got like... Well, uh, there's a couple that come with it, first of all, uh, just to get those out of the way. There's two and a half inch IDE okay. adapter, and then there's a three and a half inch IDE. So if we can probably show that right. Eh, yep. It might be overblown. Yeah, here. it's overblown. Yeah. But just simple couple of adapters to get you the, the most standard drives. Sure. Right? But if you need to expand out into a lot of other territory, and there's a lot of adapters there that we have, yeah, uh, no joke. Inc including even SD. This will do SD, SD recoveries. Card. Oh, okay. But SD cards where you had sectors timing out. Okay. It can actually get past those. You just plug right? your SD card in here, hook it up to SATA data and power. It's yep. got a little uh, KTC controller on there to do all that. Looks like we've, looks like we've got M.2 adapters, um, some for the Apple specific. There's, there's two different Apple specific uh, adapters, and Apple uses uh, connectors that are not M.2 standard. Right. So They're need, electrically, electrically similar, but 
not the same. Not physically. Um, yeah, again, I mean, this one obviously looks different. This is for 2012 MacBook Air SSD and Retina SSD to SATA 6 gigabit per yeah. second. Realize, we can, yeah. only, we can only do SATA stuff here. Like, we can't do NVMe PCIe. or PCIe stuff right. with this device. At least, not yet. Sure. Um, all sorts of different. Uh, zero insertion force, low insertion force, like the ones that were... Remember those SSDs way back when they first started coming out? It just had a really thin ribbon connecting to the drive. Is your IDE connection again? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where's, where's the zero insertion force one? I think it was in a bed. Yeah, that's a. Oh yeah. Comes with, it comes with a little mini ribbon cable. Like my the the original laptop that would have. Yeah. Yep. Right. So you're basically covered, and there's even a compact flash. Nice. Yeah. So uh, that whole set of adapters, the additional adapters there, uh, runs. It's three hundred bucks. Okay. But I don't even think you could find all those individually, and they would add up. No, so some of these seem very specific. They are very obscure and yeah. very specific. Um, but that's, that, that's that cool. pretty much, yeah, and this is even like mSATA. Like, you're basically covered right. on, on anything that is a, a SATA device so, or an ID device. So this is obviously, this is not a, every consumer should go buy this device. Do you, no, no, Do no. you think, th what's your takeaway from it? Is, is it a worth the money type of thing? Obviously with the caveat of if you... If you do this for a living, if you work for a small business, medium-sized business, large business even, and you're often recovering hard drives from, uh, you know, your employees' laptops, this might be something that your IT department that's, wants to invest in. That's their market. In. Yeah. Yeah. Like small mom and pops, IT departments for, you know, medium, large-sized businesses, stuff like that. Um, because just one drive, it, provided the company doesn't have to go inside the drive, because mm -hmm. that's obviously the limit of this. You right. can't... You know, You're not going to disassemble it and look at the platters. Right. That's meant for other people and more, you know, extreme gear. Right. right. Um, but for anything else, this definitely does it. And for a couple of grand, like, each a, a single drive recovery um, where a place would plug it into a unit like this mm -hmm. and not have to dive into it would run about 300 bucks. Right. So 300 bucks versus two grand. Like, once you get, you don't have to do that many drives... Maybe, um, maybe we open up a side business at the new office. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your hard drives in, we'll plug into this thing and hit start. Yeah, but I, I would say <laughs> I, I was kind of skeptical when they first approached me about this, but, yeah. I, but after plugging in multiple hard drives of my own that I, I mean, I'm a hard drive nut, so I just had a stash of here's Alan's, hard drives that are probably here's dead. Alan's dead hard drive stack, right? right? And I just, out of curiosity, I just started, you know, cycling the drives through this thing, and out of, I, I think it was all, nearly 20 drives that I put through this, there was one that it couldn't talk to, but it was clearly dead because it just wouldn't spin up. Hmm. Like the motor was the dead motor or something dead. in it, right? Okay. But basically, any drive that I plugged in that would spin, uh, it was able to talk to, and a couple of them, I couldn't even get to connect to any system. Like Wouldn't show you know, up when you connect into a PC. BIOS yeah. didn't even see them, and, and, that, and they showed up in there, and I was just kind of like... That's pretty cool. Yeah, jaw-dropping moment there. That's really cool. So this is uh, the Rapid Spar. What's yes. the main company's name? Deep Spar. Deep Spar. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just buy this? Do you buy it directly from them? Is it available yep. in normal places? Directly from them. Okay. And it's $19.99 or so? Uh, $19.50. $19.50. Okay. 45 so shipping, so $19.95. $19.95 with shipping, <laughs> plus 300 bucks if you want all the adapters. Obviously, not for every consumer, but if you find yourself frequently doing this, yeah. it might be something uh, worth investing in. Obviously, you're going to have a, a, a write-up on this. We will. Up on PCPer.com, uh, so make sure you check that out if you want more details. Uh, and hopefully you found this video uh, interesting and educational, if nothing else. Thanks, guys. Thanks. If you enjoyed this content, consider supporting in-depth technical content by contributing at patreon.com slash pcper.